10 and ready, I'm going to go through this quickly. But how many of you were not here last night? You did, need, did not hear the start of this. Man, we had a, this place was packed out last night. I believe it'll be even more packed out tonight. I started talking about the fear of God and I define that fear is not talking about terror, being afraid, but it's talking about reverence, honoring. And we went through a lot of scriptures about what the fear of God was. I want to continue that today and just uh, say that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. That is a direct scripture. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth. Froward here in the King James means a lying mouth. Not speaking the truth. Do I hate? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Let me turn around and say it this way. That if you don't hate these things that are mentioned right here then you do not fear God. And boy, this brings up a real conflict in today's church that basically most Christians are taught that we aren't supposed to hate anything, that we are supposed to love everyone. And that is not what the scripture teaches. We'll often say, well, you hate the sin, but you love the person. Well, that's true, but at the same time, there are some people that are so identified with evil that you need to hate everything that they stand for. Well, I got a few amens. That's more than I was thinking. But you know what? Most Christians today, oh no, we're supposed to love everybody. Let me share some things with you. It says you're supposed to hate Pride. Pride is being so promoted in our society today. And man, I could go through and start naming things. I'm not real qualified because I don't watch a lot of television, but the little few advertisements and things that I see, there is so much pride, self-promotion that is being crammed down our throat. The scripture says that you're supposed to hate that. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth. Froward is talking about a lying mouth. Man, I could name names. I'm going to refrain myself from doing it because I love people, although I hate the sin. But I could name names that there are people up saying things, and I mean they are absolute lies. You know, they came up with a test to check politicians to find out if they're telling a lie. The test is you look them straight in the face, and if their lips are moving, they're lying. <laughs> That's a little over-exaggeration, but it's close, praise God. I'm telling you, we ought to hate lying. We ought to hate misrepresenting things. And let me just point out that the scripture says in Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments is, you shall not bear false witness. It didn't say you shall not lie. It says you shall not bear false witness. Did you know that Abraham, when they asked him about his wife, Sarah, he said, she's my sister. Did you know that wasn't a lie? She was his sister, but it was false witness. It broke the Ten Commandments if the Ten Commandments would have existed during that time. It was contrary to it. And there are people that misrepresent things, constantly tell half-truths. If you are a person that fears the Lord, you need to hate half-truths. You need to hate people that misrepresent things, that overstate it. Ministers are famous for this. How many people are you running in your church? A thousand. There's only a hundred there. I had one guy say, well, I'm running after a thousand. <laughs> but you know what? We ministers constantly exaggerate and things. It's false witness. If you tell a person that you're going to be at church at 7 o'clock and you don't even leave house, the house until 7 o'clock and you get there at 7.15 or 7.30, you are bearing false witness. When you tell a person you're going to be at their house, it's false witness. You know, we had a man come one time to put in an alarm system at our ministry. And anyway, I was busy and I had things scheduled. He was supposed to be there at 10 o'clock and he showed up around 10.30. And he walked in and I noticed he had one of these holsters that he kept his phone on. And so I saw that he had a cell phone 
And when he got there, I said, you know, you're late. And he said, well, yeah, you know, the traffic was bad, but I'm here now. Everything's fine. And I said, no, it's not fine. I said, uh, you lied to me. He said, oh, no, I got caught in traffic. I said, you got a cell phone. You could have called. And he says, well, but I'm here now. It's all that counts. And I said, no, it's not. I said, you aren't a person of your word. If this is the way you treat me before you get my business, what's it going to be like once I get your business? I said, I don't want you. And he got offended and I kicked him out. <laughs> because I hate lying. I hate false witness. And yet I can guarantee there's people right here that your word, when you tell people things, you may or may not do it. Did you know that's not the fear of God? You don't respect God. You don't respect other people. When you tell a person you're going to be someplace and then you wind up being late, and I'm, I understand that you could have a flat, you could have a wreck. If something happens, you could call, you could let a person know. But for you to just not care about other people's time and you not honor your word and not do things, you are not a God-fearing person. Psalms chapter 15, verse 4, I believe it is, says that a godly man will swear to his own hurt and not change. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, you'll do it. What it'll do, it'll make you quit promising things that you can't deliver on. But if you do say that you're going to do something, you will do it even to your own detriment. If that is not the way that you are, if words to you don't mean much and you just say things and promise all kinds of things but don't deliver on it, you do not fear God. And last night, I won't go back through these scriptures, but I was showing that fearing God is also not uh, cursing the deaf, not putting a stumbling block before the blind, and it's not taking advantage of other people. It's honoring people that are older than you. It's honoring your parents. If you don't honor other people and honor their time and you take advantage of them and you manipulate them with the things that you say, you are not a God-fearing person. I'm not saying any of these things to condemn anybody, but as I, I read that verse last night, that you can learn the fear of the Lord. You, the first step to having the fear of the Lord is understanding what it is. And it's hating evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth or a mouth that says one thing and does another. You need to hate that in yourself and in other people. Amen. Well, as Pastor Jerome said, you're having to endure this. It may not be one of those that you stand up and say, praise God a lot, but I tell you what, you need to hear this. Again, I could call some names, but um, I'm debating about it. <laughs> but you know, there was a man that stood up and accused President Trump of all kinds of things on this call to the, um, what, who was it, Ukrainian pa uh, president. And he just slandered him and said all kinds of things. Then President Trump released the transcript, which he thought he'd never do. And man, he was caught flat-footed just lying through his teeth. And he's the one that's in charge of the impeachment stuff. That's wrong. You ought to hate that. You ought to hate it. I don't care what you think about President Trump. That's just a bold-faced lie. And this has become normal. I'm telling you, there's things in our society that it is coming unraveled unless we go back to the fear of God, unless people begin to start getting to where they hate every evil way. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. A person who is not departing from evil does not fear the Lord. You know, I had a woman come up to me just a few minutes ago and say that last time I was here, I said something about shacking up with, your, with a person. And she'd been shacking up with the guy for uh, 40 years. And she humbled herself and took advantage of what I said and said that she is the happiest she's ever been in her life, that, man, God's blessing her. I tell you what, if you are living in evil, if you are intentionally doing something that you know is wrong, you do not fear God. And it's a direct inroad of Satan into your life. Now, again, I preach the grace of God. God loves you. 
I'm not saying that God rejects you. I'm not saying that you can't be a Christian, but I am saying that you are just giving Satan a free shot at you and he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And if you give Satan entrance into your life, he's going to exact a price from you. And I guarantee you, if you fear God, you ought to start departing from evil, hate every evil way, pride, arrogance. Man, pride. I could spend the whole time here talking about pride, but our society has exalted self. You know, I was just talking with Kurt uh, yesterday. We were out walking and stuff. And people today, feelings are all important to people. They just, well, I feel this. It's one of the things that people ask nowadays. Well, how does this make you feel? Who gives a rip how you feel? We have exalted feelings, self, and it doesn't matter what the truth is. I feel this way. Pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. That is immature to the max, exalting yourself and how you feel. You need to do what's right, and it doesn't matter if it makes you feel good or not. Sometimes it makes you feel bad to do the right things, but you just do what's right regardless of how you feel. Anyway, I'm going to move on in the name of Jesus. <laughs> love has to hate whatever comes against the object of his love. Again, the reason I put this in here is because when you talk about to hate evil, some people, Christians say, we shouldn't hate anybody. Matter of fact, I was in a church one time and I was getting on the devil's case and just telling the you know, people that they need to hate the devil. They need to resist the devil. You can't compromise with the devil. And I just was blasting the devil. And the pastor came up to me after the church service and he says, we don't talk to anybody that way, not even the devil. And I said, that's the problem. Did you know you can cuss the devil out? That'll be okay. You could let the devil have it. You can say all the mean things you want to say to the devil. You should have no reverence or fear of the devil whatsoever. And if you say that you love God, then you have to hate whatever is coming against the object of your love. If I love Jamie, which I do, and if you came up to attack Jamie, I guarantee I would be wrong to sit there and say, well, I, I just love you so much that I, you know, help yourself, do whatever. <laughs> She's my sister. I've never seen her before. <laughs> you know what? That's not love. If you truly love somebody, you have to hate anything or anyone who's coming against it. And that's the way it is with God. God so loved the world that he gave. But I guarantee you in the book of Revelation, you are going to find God slaying people. The horse, the blood will flow up to the horse's bridles. That means it's three to four feet high for the space of 120 miles. And you know what the Christians are doing? The believers are doing, they're praising God and saying, you're just because you have dealt with them righteously. They have shed the prophet's blood and you have given them blood to drink. That is a godly reaction. Amen. I know some of you are thinking, man, what did I stumble into today? I'm not saying that you hate people, but you need to hate evil and you need to hate people that have aligned themselves with evil. You know, we had a situation when we were building our uh, first building in Woodland Park. And for two and a half years, I tried to comply. That, there was this housing addition that was next door to us that had some control over our water rights. And anyway, for two and a half years, we dealt with this. And we were patient and we were kind and all of these things, and they were just mean. It was mean-spirited, the things that they were doing. And the man who was the head of the housing addition said to the people that he hated us, he didn't want us. We actually had homosexuals get up and testify in front of the city council that we hated homosexuals and that we were going to kill them and skin them and put their hide on <laughs> fence posts. That was said in public meetings about us. And so anyway, they hated us. And for two and a half years, I just prayed and believed God. And finally, one day I was driving by there and I said, I've had about all of this I can take. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I'm commanding this man who is standing there and who has given himself over to the devil to get out of my way or God just run over him, do whatever you got to do. But this is over now in the name of Jesus. Did you know that week we got our permits? 
And I don't know what happened to that guy. I don't know if he was still, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't against him personally, but I was against the evil. It's like Smith Wigglesworth. I heard him say this one time that people criticized him because he was just so mean. He would hit people. He, would, he took a baby one time that had water on the brain. And this was a one-year-old baby. And he got this baby and kicked it off the stage into the front row. But you know what? When it landed, it was healed. <laughs> and people criticized him. You can't do this. You hit people. You do. And he says, look, I'm not against people. I'm just mad at the devil. I'm trying to get the devil. I can't help it if their body gets in the way. <laughs> And that's the way I feel. I'm not against people. I pray for, I, man, I'm trying to refrain myself from calling names, but I am praying for certain people. But I have said this. I said, that person has given themselves over to evil. They are for killing babies even after they're born. How evil is that? You might be able to say somebody's ignorant when they don't, you know, when the baby is still in the womb. But once it's born and you want to still kill it, that's murder. That's evil. It's demonic. And I have been praying and saying, I am against this evil. And I pray that these people get born again and that they get changed. I'd love for them to be my brother or sister in the Lord. I'd love to see them change. But if they don't change, I'm commanding that they get out of the way. I am against this evil. And I'm speaking that this evil stops in the name of Jesus. And there's a lot of Christians. There's probably a lot of Christians right here in this room that you would never do anything like that because you've been taught to be just totally passive in everything. Jesus wasn't passive. Look at this in John chapter 2, verse 14. It says, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. This is Jesus who was love. And he made a whip and he beat people with that whip. I guarantee you, he didn't just hold the whip and threaten them. He beat them. He hit people with the whip. This is Jesus. He beat people with the whip. And do you realize he didn't just do this once? This is at the very beginning, the very first time he was in Jerusalem at the first of his ministry. But in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12, Mark chapter 11, verse 15, Luke chapter 19, the very last week of his life, he did the exact same thing. He had to go into the temple a second time because they had put all of the money changers back in there and he drove them out a second time. Did you know that that was Jesus? The one who was loved, the one who said, turn the other cheek. People say, well, how do you reconcile this? You know, I don't have a perfect answer for this, but the way I look at it is that, look, if you come at me and persecute me for the gospel, then I won't retaliate. I am not going to defend myself. And I could give you a lot of examples of this, but, you know, I had some of my staff come to me. This is before Paul and Billy, but prior to that time, I had some staff come to me and they showed me these blogs that were written against me. And there was one blog that says I was the most dangerous man in America. They've accused me of things. They've lied about me. And there's thousands of blogs about what a terrible person I am. And they came and said, uh, you know, we can change this. We can, I don't know what they were talking about, but they can do something that will take those blog sites down or something. I don't understand how that stuff works. But they were telling me this and I stopped them right in the middle and I said, look, I do not want one penny of the money that God gives me coming to defend myself. Man, that is not what God called me to do. You know, there was a prophecy given to me back in the very beginning when Jamie and I were still in the Baptist church and man, we were being persecuted and uh, I would do good for a while, but then everybody had just criticized us and I'd I'd get off the track and things. And so anyway, I was at a meeting and a man called me out and he said, I see you like a runner on one of these oval tracks. And he said, you're running a race and you're leading the pack, 
but the people in the grandstands are arguing at you and telling you you're doing it all wrong and you ought to go the other way. And he said, I see you getting off of the track and running up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators. And he says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. Stay on track. Stay on track. Man, that was a word from God for me. And since that time, I guarantee you, I am not going to spend any time trying to justify myself. And I told my staff, don't spend any of our money trying to do this. Well, after two or three months, they came back and gave me a new round of blogs and says, we've come up with a way we can. And I said, look, I told you, I don't want you defending me and justifying me. I said, God will take care of me. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord, I'll repay. So when it comes to defending myself, I'm not going to defend myself. I'll turn the other cheek. If you come and, you know, uh, Pastor Jerome was talking about people who have given and then take their money back. We had that happen just two weeks ago. We've had people that have asked for everything that they have given over 10 years back. We have this happen all the time. And of course, legally, we can't give back money that they've already filed a taxes on and got a tax deduction for. But we give people back their money as long as it's within the same calendar year. And we have this happen all the time. And I agree 100% that that's just digging your own grave financially. That is totally wrong to do that. Why did I even get off on that? <laughs> there was some purpose in me saying that. Say again. Anyway, I don't defend myself. I don't remember what I was saying about that. I got distracted by money. <laughs> That's true what he was saying. Amen. <laughs> so anyway, I won't defend my... If you want to come take my money from me for the gospel, this is what I brought that up for. People, you know, I'll give it back to them. And I do that. But if you come and want to take my $20 out of my pocket... I had somebody give me a $20 offering, and if it's personal, if you aren't stealing from me because of my Christian stance, if you're coming against me in just the natural and, and you're against me, boy, you had best be able to defend yourself for my $20. <laughs> I'll, I'll take persecution... If it's for the Lord's sake, but man, if you're just coming against me in the natural, I guarantee you, I am not one of these that's going to roll over and probably dead. I had a friend of mine that was in England with me, and they got stopped at a subway station late at night, and a girl came up to him and asked for money, and then two guys came up behind with a knife, and he wound up giving them all of the money, his watch and everything. And when he got to our meeting, he was totally broke. He lost his credit cards and everything. And I said, man, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have fought him. He says, they had a knife and there was three of them. I'd have told them, look, when I was in Vietnam, I was trained how to kill a person with my bare hands. I may not get all three of you, but which one wants to die for my 20 bucks? <laughs> That's exactly the way that I am. You want my 20 bucks, you're going to have to fight me for it. And you might win because I'm not a great fighter, but I guarantee you, I am not going to roll over and give in to evil. You know, we discovered that at 9-11. 9-11, they hijacked these planes and flew them into the Twin Towers and things like this. But the, but the last plane that was headed, they believe, for the White House, they overcame those people because they finally realized that giving in and being passive is why these people with nothing but a box cutter were able to overcome hundreds of people because people are taught to be passive. I guarantee you, if everybody would stand up and hate evil, and if you're going to persecute me for the gospel's sake, I'll turn the other cheek. I'll let you steal from me and take my cloak and get your money back if it's for the gospel's sake. But if you want to come against me in just the natural realm, you had best be willing to fight. And when you stand up to a bully like that, you'll find out that the vast majority of the time they quit. They only pray on the weak. You need to get to where you hate evil. Look at this in... Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse, let's see, I'm on the wrong page, but anyway, I know where it is. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It says, uh, what does that say? Put that up there. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. 
What does that say? Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Did you know people interpret that as that means God knows that we're just human. We're going to get angry. And so God knows it. Just make sure that before you go to bed every night, you confess it and get everything settled. This is not giving you permission to be angry as long as the sun is up. This is talking about be angry without sin. There is a godly anger. There is a righteous anger. Did you know God created you with the capacity for anger? Some of you have never thought about this, but I can guarantee every person has the ability to get angry. It is not just a few folks that this is their type of personality. Every single person has the capacity for anger. God built it into us because there is a right use of anger. We are supposed to hate evil. We're supposed to hate uh, pride and arrogancy and all of these things. And we are supposed to not let the sun go down upon our wrath. That's talking about don't ever let it go to sleep. Keep it stirred up. Keep yourself angry. You, you know, the reason that I don't get sick and so many other people do, I'm not saying this to put anybody down, but I guarantee you I hate sickness. Hate it. I hate it. I'm going to say some things that many of you will think, you are absolutely weird. Well, I think you're weird. <laughs> but I'd no more be sick than I'd go commit adultery. And some of you, well, I don't have any control over whether I'm sick. That's the reason you get sick is because you don't understand your authority and you will give in to it. And if you have a pain, you will submit to it. You know, I, it was a couple of years ago, I was opening a jar and I mean, my hand hurt when I went to squeeze that thing. I don't know for sure what arthritis is, but I prayed with so many other people. I suspect it was arthritis or something. And anyway, my hand hurt when I began to open that thing. You know what? I said no in the name of Jesus. And I must have taken that lid off and put it back on a hundred times just in the name of Jesus. I refuse to do this. But there's a lot of people that you'll have a pain and you'll say, oh, I can't do that anymore. And you accept it. I hate sickness. I had a pain in my foot for probably the last year and something. I've had, anyway, I'm not going to describe it because some of you will come up and tell me what it was. I don't care what it was. It doesn't matter to me what it was. Jesus paid for it and I am not going to have pain in my feet. And so you know how I responded to it? I've been walking anywhere from six to eight miles a day and doing the exact same thing that I don't feel like doing. And I hate being sick. I hate having problems. I hate it. God gave us the capacity to hate something. You need to hate sickness. You need to hate arrogance and pride. You need to hate carnality. You need to hate sin. And if you don't hate it, then you'll embrace it. You'll put up with it. Most people just give token resistance to thing. And if it keeps knocking at the door, well, I tried. I've had people come up to me before and say, you know, I, I, I've tried to resist this and I just can't overcome it. And I'll say, well, in James chapter four, verse seven, submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And they say, well, I've done that and it didn't work. What am I supposed to do? Agree with you and say the word doesn't work? Oh, but I tried that. Well, it's not trying it. Resisting is fighting. It's hating something. And it's not just trying and saying in the name of Jesus, please leave. That's not resisting the devil. We were ministering deliverance to a person one time and we told him, you need to renounce the devil that you got demons because you welcomed them in. You will let them into your life. You need to renounce the devil. And so we knelt around this table and we were going to pray. And I said, you need to renounce the devil. And this woman goes, dear devil. <laughs> and I had to stop her and I say, that's not resisting the devil when you address him as dear devil. I'm telling you, if you're saying I resisted and it didn't work, I resisted this problem, I resisted sickness and it hadn't worked, you hadn't resisted. Resisting is hating. You need to get angry. And again, I've, I've had people, well, I just don't get angry at anything. Well, then die. 
because you have to get to where you hate sickness. You have to hate disease. You have to hate this stuff. We got a lot of weak, weak Christians that don't hate anything, that you just roll with the punches and whatever happens. I'm not saying that you hate people. I'm not against people, but I am against demonic stuff. And let me give you a clue here. Some of you, you may choke on this, but I'm going to tell you the truth regardless. That you know what's called political correctness and the attitude that is so prevalent even in Christianity today, it is the spirit of Antichrist. It is a demonic spirit. It is demons that have pushed abortion even to the point of birth and letting that child die. It is demonic to push transgenderism and teach little tiny kids that you are actually a girl. I saw a thing yesterday that I don't know, I was reading something and it popped up and I looked at it and it was a man in a store that had a pink purse over his shoulder and the person referred to him as sir. And he got mad and started screaming, I'm a woman. And he was screaming and started kicking and breaking things and cussing. And you give me the address of your manager. I'm going to come against you. You don't respect my transgenderism and stuff. And it was the ugliest looking woman you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> it was a man. Did you realize that every, I was reading that in England, they found some things that they, or excuse me, it wasn't England, it was uh, Rome. They found the skulls of gladiators. They said it was the first gladiator skulls that they'd ever found. And they were checking them, how they had died, and many of their skulls were crashed in, uh, crushed in and things. And did you know they said they were all male? Did you know it was thousands of years later? And you know how they can tell that they're a male just by their skull? Because every cell in your body, in your brain, in your bones, every cell of a person, if you are a male, you got an X and a Y chromosome. And if you are a female, you got two X chromosomes. And that's biological. A thousand years from now, after you're dead and gone and your bones are buried, you're going to be male or female. I don't care what hormones you took or what you said or how people referred to you. You are on a cellular level, a male or a female. And it's perversion. It's demonic to confuse people about whether you're a male or a female. It's of the devil. It is a spirit of antichrist. Amen. And I'm not, I don't hate people. I'm, I love them enough to tell them the truth. You know, Jesus, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. And the second is like unto this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let me read to you where that was quoted from. This is Leviticus chapter 19. And in verse 18, it says, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Jesus quoted that verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at the context of it. Go back just one verse. In verse 17, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. This says that if you love your neighbor in context, you have to in any wise, under any circumstances, tell them the truth, rebuke them and not suffer sin upon them. If you sit there and refuse to tell a person the truth because you're afraid, I don't want to offend somebody. They might take it wrong. You can whitewash that any way you want to, but the problem is you love yourself more than you love that person. You're willing to let that person die and go to hell. You're willing to let that person destroy their life because you don't want to be called a fanatic or somebody say something against you. If you truly love a person, you're going to tell a person the truth. Now, the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, that we're supposed to speak the truth in love. I'm not saying that you use the word like a club and just go out and tell people that God hates them and stuff like that. But you need to tell a person the truth. Do it in love, but tell a person the truth. 
You know, where we live is up in the mountains and we have these twisty, turny roads that go up there. And one night I was driving home and there was a fog. And I mean, you couldn't see from here to the back of this room. The, the visibility was so bad. And anyway, I had a car pass me going about 50 something, 60 miles an hour. And he zipped around that corner and I saw his lights come on and his car jerked to the right. So I slammed on my brakes. And anyway, when I got up there next to him, I was on the shoulder. He was in the right lane. On the left lane was a horse that he had hit. And this horse had crashed in his windshield and he was laying there with blood all over him. And I was over trying to help him. And as I was trying to help this guy, a Suburban came around the corner at about 60 miles an hour and hit that horse. And it launched this horse in the air, uh, I don't know, five feet, 10 feet high or something, and maybe 20 or 30 feet. And the woman who was driving, it was able to gain control. She didn't wreck the car. But when I got up there to check on her, she had made a bubble in the roof of her um, of car where her head had hit it and she was laying there hurt. And then I heard other cars coming around the corner. So you know what I did? I ran down the road, back around the corner on a foggy night. It was pitch black. And I started jumping out in front of cars that were going 50 and 60 miles an hour, trying to flag them down and to stop them. And people were slamming on their brakes. I heard people screaming and yelling at me, honking, waving at me with one finger. They were doing all of these things, and I can guarantee you, I, didn't, I don't like people's rejection. I imagine that there was probably some women, and here is a guy out on a dark road trying to flag their car down. I bet you that there were people that misunderstood my motives, that said things about me that they shouldn't have said. But how in the world could I say that I truly love another person and I, if I just let them come around the corner? and run into this wreck, and I mean all lanes of traffic were blocked 60 miles an hour, there would have been, it probably took 20 minutes at least, maybe 30 minutes before the police showed up, there could have been 50, 100 people that would have had wrecks. And even though people might have misunderstood my motives and stuff, if you say that you love people, how in the world can you say you love them and just allow them to live in sin? Did you know that homosexuality, this is from the, the LGBTQRXYZ website. <laughs> Their own things say that there is the suicide rate among homosexuals is 300 times as much as it is among heterosexuals. 300 times. You know, the homosexuality, the, homo, the average homosexual dies 21 years earlier than a heterosexual counterpart. 21 years it takes off of their life. Cigarettes take an average of seven years off of a person's life. And yet we put a warning on cigarettes that this is hazardous to your health. If we weren't politically correct, and inspired by the devil where we're only promoting ungodliness instead of godly actions, we ought to put a warning on every homosexual out of love saying that this is hazardous to your health. I'm not against homosexual. I've got friends that are homosexual. I've got people that work for me that have struggled with homosexuality and we had to deal with it and I didn't fire them. They're still working for me. I did not fire them. I do not treat people badly. But I can guarantee you, I tell a person it's the truth. It's the truth. It's not good for you. God made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And you are, you know, we've had people come, what are we going to do if a transgender wants to go in? I said, just pull their pants down and check their plumbing. And that's who they are. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of lawyers that tell me not to say the things I'm saying, but I tell you, I'm just telling you the truth. Did you know that there was one time a person who came up and asked me what the problem was and I was, I knew what the problem was and I was going to tell them, but I knew they weren't going to like it. I knew that they were going to be offended. And I was sitting there listening to them debating about, am I going to tell this person the truth? Knowing that it's only the truth that sets people free. As long as you are deceived, there's no chance of you receiving the, you know, deliverance. You got to know the truth. And as I debated this, the Lord just spoke to me and says, you do not have the right 
to reject the truth for that person. And as I thought about that, I got to thinking that if I don't tell a person the truth because I'm afraid that they may not like it and they might not receive it, then I rejected the truth for them. I didn't even give them the honor of rejecting the word on their own. I don't have the right to reject the truth for you. I need to speak the truth. You know, a minister is in a sense like an interpreter. I've had interpreters in foreign countries. And when I get up and say things, I, I remember this one interpreter in Germany. He didn't agree with the thing I said. And, and finally, the pastor got up and made the interpreter sit down because he was misinterpreting everything. I would say things that he didn't agree with, so he'd just change it. And you know what? That's a terrible interpreter. Well, in a sense, a minister is an interpreter for the Lord. We are hearing from God and we are speaking what God tells us to say. And I don't have the right to sit here and change it because this is politically incorrect because it offends the sensibilities of people. If I love you, I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm telling you the fear of God is to hate evil. It's to stand against these things. You can love the person, but you go for that devil. You go for that demonic deception. You go for this spirit of antichrist that is, uh, you know, in epidemic proportions in our society. You have to stand against that and you need to stand up and speak the truth and speak it in love. Whether you know it or not, I love you. I'm telling you the truth because we need to counter this ungodliness. And there are so many Christians, even ministers, let me rephrase that, especially ministers who are intimidated and afraid and will not stand up and speak the truth. You know, it was um, Charles Finney that said, if America ever fails, the responsibility lies at the feet of the pastors because we didn't speak the truth. And that is exactly what's happened. We've got pastors, we've got people today that won't stand up and speak about political things. I'm telling you, this nation was founded with the forefathers. They preached and they named people and said, vote for this person because they are a godly person. Vote against this person because they're ungodly. That's the way that our nation was founded. Sermons were quoted, I forget the exact number, but it's over 70 something times in our constitution, exact phrases from sermons. Were quote, it is not wrong for us to stand up and say this is right and wrong. We need to stand up. There is a minister, I'm quitting, believe it or not. I didn't get very far, but I am going to quit. But there was a minister in San Francisco that I was visiting with, and I just asked him, I said, do you have a problem with you know the homosexual community and stuff because they're real strong in San Francisco. And he said, oh no, God told me just to love them. I never say anything about it. And I said, so you've never said that that's not an acceptable practice and that this isn't the way that God wants people to live. And he said, oh no, God told me just to love them and to never say anything that would offend anybody. And I said, well, I can understand your logic for that. But I said, what about your young people? I said, I can guarantee you the young people in school are having this crammed down their throat and told that this is an acceptable lifestyle. Did you know in Colorado, they've passed this House Bill 1032 that actually promotes all forms of homosexuality, bestiality, everything. And they actually describe it and talk about how you have homosexual sex. That's being taught to fourth graders. And that's not uh, Colorado alone, uh, California, Washington State, I think Virginia, and there's a lot of, these bills are being introduced all over the nation. And we just happen to be doing something about that in 2020. I'll be announcing that soon. So we're making a big push on that. But I told this pastor, I said, I can guarantee you, your young people in school are being told this ungodliness. And if the church doesn't stand up and say, no, this is the way God created sex to be. Well, then where are they going to get it from? And he thought, I've never thought of that. That's terrible. 
I'm telling you, a pastor, a minister has a responsibility not to hate people, but to hate the evil and to stand up and say, this is godly and this is ungodly. There are consequences to your actions. And we need, you need to recognize that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You don't hate the person, but you hate that evil. And if that person is going to be a promoter of it and give themselves over to the devil, then you need to pray that that person gets out of the way.